Yep. <laughs> <laughs> And it looks like I'm going to go ahead and share the results of the poll because we're getting ready to get started. Um, but it looks like most of you are familiar with other genealogy resources that other than Ancestry.com, but maybe not, maybe relying on it a lot. <laughs> <clears throat> so we see we've got about 50% 50, 50 of you are saying you sometimes use things other than Ancestry. And around 20% of you are saying either rarely or never. Mm -hmm. so. Well, that's good. Then this is a good audience for us. Exactly. This is perfect. I'm going to change the screen over, and we'll go ahead and get started. We're perfect, Rosemary. I guess. That's right. <laughs> that's well, welcome, are. everyone. Welcome, everybody, to today's webinar, Beyond Ancestry. Uh, my name is Charlie Taylor. I'm one of the CE consultants here at KDL. KDLA. I'll be facilitating the webinar this morning. Our presenters are uh, Rosemary Mazaros and Catherine Penavaria. See their photos there on the on the screen. So I'm going to turn over the presentation to them in just one second. A little bit of housekeeping uh, before we get started. At the end of the presentation, you'll be able to download your own copy of these slides that you can refer back to. Um, there, it'll be the same content that was sent out in the handout yesterday afternoon. It will just be the full size slides. So you don't have to squint to look at it. And you can feel free to save that to your computer, refer to it in the future, whatever you'd like to do. You'll also be receiving um, a certificate of attendance that you can use for certification renewal. And that will be going out in an email hopefully this afternoon. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to chat those in as we go along. Catherine and Rosemary are great about keeping up with the chat. If you have technical issues, please chat those in too, uh, and I'll do my best to help you out. So I'm going to mute myself now and turn the presentation over to you all. OK, thank you so much, Charlie. Well, hi, everyone. Rosemary and I are very happy to be here to talk to you about resources beyond ancestry. My name is Catherine Penavaria. I am the Visual and Performing Arts Library Coordinator at Western Kentucky University. And I'm Rosemary Mazaros, Government Documents and Law Librarian at WKU. Before we get on to talking about the resources, I just wanted to make uh, clear that a lot of what we're going to talk about I actually cover in great detail in my recently published book, Genealogy, A Practical Guide for Librarians. So if you haven't seen this and you are interested in kind of expand, expanding on what I've talked about today, uh, you'll, you'll find everything there. I do have some discount flyers if you are interested in purchasing that or recommending it for purchase. So just uh, email me if you would like any of those. OK, I want to start off with this motto, without proof it isn't truth. This is important for all genealogy researchers to remember because if you just tell somebody, well, this is what happened. My grandfather, great-grandfather fought in the uh, Civil War, or that's probably too young. But you, you can't actually get that validated without some documentation. So in other words, you have to operate always with this idea that you are looking for the proof of kinship connections and dates and people's movements, OK? And what, what is proof? Proof is original records, OK? Proof of something is not somebody's recollection 40 years later. It's original records that demonstrate something actually happened at the time. Go ahead. OK. <clears throat> now, even though we call it <laughs> beyond ancestry, uh, we're not going to disparage and throw ancestry under the bus. Uh, we love it, uh, and uh, it certainly is a major part of our research. But there's more stuff out there, and that's what we want to show you. Mm -hmm. OK. Also, um, this presentation will be available after, uh, the, uh, after we sign off. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to take frantic notes if you don't want to. No. OK. Why we need ancestry? Because it has original sources, <coughs> census, and other data. Powerful searching engines. Uh, you can post and view your family trees. You have user connections. You can find people who want to chat in a forum about uh, similar ancestors or anything, research, anything. So it allows you in your, in your uh, um, 
personal subscription actually to use mm -hmm. to have these connections. And it also has a wiki or help center. All advantages. Now, if anybody remembers from Mad Magazine Spy versus Spy, <laughs> we're doing ancestry versus ancestry. So what we're going to um, compare here in a bit is uh, personal subscriptions versus library subscriptions. The advantage goes to a personal subscription because you can upload and view your family tree, you can contact other users, you can shop, create photo books, hire experts, order DNA kits, and you can view certain collections that are not available in a library subscription. That little reminder down there at the bottom, Smithsonian Libraries, that's a heck of a URL, isn't it? But uh, Smithsonian will make a comparison for you between personal and library subscriptions. Yeah, it's a side-by-side -side comparison. So really, there's no question that a personal subscription gives you way more. Um, I'm, I'm not, it's not to disparage the library subscription. If that's all somebody has access to, then that's great. Um, but we do love Ancestry. We just wanted to get that out of the way. Um, mm -hmm. But now, moving beyond Ancestry. These are some of the categories that you uh, can, might think of as, as, as holding original records. Uh, and a lot of them, some of them are online, some of them aren't, and a lot of them are we are going to talk about here today. Um, family papers, I'm going to talk about that. We also, uh, you, you would want, definitely if you're doing research, you'd want to look at international and church records. Ancestry does not have a whole lot of those. It does have an international subscription. But I have never been convinced that it was really worth the extra price. I'm going to recommend the, uh, FamilySearch.org for international records later. And we're going to talk a little bit about some uh, finding obituaries and burial records, and then some uh, marriage and divorce. Divorce records are court records, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And some of those other ones. And the one, the first one, I'm going to actually give you an example of um, uh, is some personal papers that I found with a friend of mine. I was helping her do her family history research. And, you know, we started off doing ancestry searching. And then, you know, I said, well, where's the family papers? Who has the family papers? You know, and she said, what do you mean? I said, you know, there's stuff people don't throw away. There's, there's important looking papers like death certificates and burial deeds, that p divorce decrees, people tend to save. In, in some kind of a, you know, like maybe even a slightly fancier box. And I just kept, you know, I kept saying this until she finally asked enough relatives and they figured out who would be likely to have it. And we were able then to acquire these. That one on the top right is actually a death announcement. It says, it, it is with deep regret and great sorrow, we announce the death of Marguerite Shaw, beloved wife of Sidney N. Shaw, July 9th, 1928. I mean, this was a little tiny card that was received by my friend's grandmother, and she just really didn't feel comfortable throwing it out somehow. It was a sort of almost kind of superstitious thing where she just wanted to keep that and preserve that. And this is not the kind of thing you're ever going to find online. An Ancestry, no other online source has, like, personal death announcements that were sent. So that's kind of a cool thing, and it gives you all those details. The one in the lower left corner was also in the grandmother's um, – box of stuff. And it's really, really interesting. Um, I was doing this research for a friend of mine and her mother, and this, so this was my friend's mother's mother. And we, we, we kind of were looking through these papers, and she pulled this out and she said, oh, I wonder what this is. My mother had to go to court. And so, you know, it turns out that it's actually a, a request from the court for her to appear as a witness in the case. It's, it's addressed to Mary and Kelly and it's to appear in the case against the Commonwealth versus John Kelly for non-support. In reality, this was Marion Kelly suing her husband who had deserted her and her five children for support. And so, you know, this is not a subpoena. This is a request for her to appear. She's actually the plaintiff. Well, not really the plaintiff, but she was kind of the one who triggered this. And she had uh, actually three of these little little court orders and she had saved them all these years you know the, the husband never came back you know he ditched them and he was forced to pay child support but but what my friend's mother said and it was really enlightening to me she said you know I always thought that she just didn't do anything that she was just a kind of a victim of you know a, a guy this man you know he left and he, he never came back 
And he, she said, and these papers prove to me that she fought for us, that she fought for, for, you know, monetary support for us. So I thought that was really interesting. So that's another, once again, family papers, they're so fabulous, and you will not find them anywhere online. This example is one of the uh, uh, things that is available to you under the Freedom of Information Act, which Rosemary is going to talk about in a bit. This is a social security application, so an application for a social security card. Everyone who has a social security number had to fill out this application or someone had to fill it out for them. I think now we, we just do it for kids when they're born just to get them their ID number. But back when social security started, and this was dated January 11, 1937, so the individual had to go to the Social Security office in, and fill out the form. And this is actually for my great-grandmother, Francesca Nasca, who was married to a, a, a Penavaria, and they spelled my name wrong, which is definitely par for the course. And the really cool thing about this, and I, I really want to stress that, that this, this, is, it, this is a more valuable type of record than, say, other types because it's one of the few types of records where the person's information is attested to by themselves. Okay, think about it. How little that ever happens. A birth record, the person who's born is not giving the information. Um, a death record, you know, Francesca's mother and father might be listed on her death record and her birth date, but she didn't say that that's who they were. In other words, you had this person standing in front of somebody and filling out this form or the person was filling it out for them. There's very few records that actually allow you to see the information as given by the person themselves. A citizenship application, like a declaration of intent is one of them, and also a draft registration card is another one. So those are, those are both available on Ancestry. But a Social Security application, you have to order from the Social Security Administration. They are not online, and I don't think they ever will be. All you have to do is prove that the person's deceased, so um, that's pretty easy to do. The cool thing about this that, that told me was that my, my great-grandmother actually was uh, not literate. I didn't know that until I saw this, but see, she didn't even sign it. She just made an X, and some other witnesses in, in the family had to sign it on her behalf. So this was kind of touching for me that I, that I got so much insight into her just with this one little thing. We must be related, Catherine, because I have a lot of X's in my family, too. <laughs> Okay, the next resource we want to talk about is newspapers. Don't neglect <coughs> um, Oh, another Penavaria. But look how they spell the name exactly Yeah, they right. spelled it right under the word spelling. <laughs> right. Um, man convicted of bank fraud. This is a reminder that anything of note in your family, like bank robbery uh, or bank fraud or um, yeah, yeah, yeah. all that stuff, uh, <laughs> this is going to make news. Even in a big city like Pittsburgh, you're going to find some information in the newspaper. So if you dig out something, a divorce, a, a conviction, mm. an arrest, uh, check it in a newspaper. And we'll get to resources mm -hmm. in newspapers in a minute. Uh, here's another type of <laughs> newspaper entry. This is going to be in the classified section in little bitty print. Mm -hmm. Another Penavaria. Here we go. A different Thomas. This is uh, a tax avoider Thomas. Story, a likely yeah. story. Okay. Yeah, these are um, delinquent taxes and going to sell his property. Uh, if uh, someone is separating from the spouse, there's mm -hmm. going to be uh, a, an ad that says they're not responsible for any debts but their own. So <coughs> don't neglect these little teeny entries in the newspaper because they are valuable with the type of information. Something else to look for, so to uh, look for a news article about, and that's if, in this case, someone died by accidental drowning. That's what this medical certificate says in 1919. Go look for an article on accidental drowning. If it's a large newspaper, it might be just a small story noting the drowning. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's a small town newspaper, it's probably making front page oh, yeah, news. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, take a look at this. So it's right, if you have important. death certificates that indicate some kind of homicide or suicide or accidental death, there's probably going to be a newspaper article about it. So not if, not if just somebody dies of a heart attack or something or, you know, children die of something. But this, this is going to – newspapers are all over 
misery, you know? So if there was right. misery, the newspapers are right behind. That's a good way to put it. That's okay, we're going to talk about sources for newspapers. Newspaper research is a complicated and challenging thing. Ancestry does have some newspapers, but really, honestly, you've got to use a wide variety of sources just to get kind of a complete picture, as, as complete as possible, of the newspaper coverage. One of my favorite subscriptions is Genealogy Bank. That's a, you know, it's just a personal subscription. This is their home page. I do not recommend going ahead with the search like right in the middle where they say search for your ancestors here. I instead would recommend that you just bypass that and go to <clears throat> their newspaper archives and, and search by area. So if you were to just go to Kentucky, and you can see a list of the newspaper titles that they have, but you can also see from that map which cities and towns are represented here. And they don't have good representation as far as the rest of the state goes, just the middle and the northern part. But if your family research is involved in, in one of those areas, then this is going to be really useful. And I really like it that you can <clears throat> yes, it's a it's a it's a personal subscription. It's not that expensive. Um, I I, I ha it's one of my I have like four or five different subscriptions, and it's one of the ones I have. So it, you might not find something useful for one place, but in another place, it'll have this full run of the newspapers, and you can find out all about people. Another paid subscription. These these ones I'm talking about are are paid subscriptions. By the way, I should have said that when I introduced them. One of my favorite ones is a clumsy title, World Vital Records, um, but uh, bypass that title problem and also bypass their search screen where it says start searching for your ancestors because they, they will give you results on the census and on the Social Security Death Index. You don't need that because those are much easier to search in Ancestry. Instead, <clears throat> just focus on their real strength, which is newspapers. So you go to view all collections and then you, that very top one, Newspaper Archive Collection, this is the goods, I am telling you. This is a phenomenal resource. So you, you can basically put in a place name and see what all the papers they have for uh, Kentucky. Now, you're, you're going to find a wide range of dates. They have, you know, things going back into the 1800s. And you just got to fool with it. You know, you can, you can set the parameters. I've, I found that, you know, <clears throat> sometimes... Uh, I'll put in, a, you know, too much information. So you want to put in, like, less limiting information. If you look on the side where they've kind of just given you a little abstract of the articles, you can see that, that they're a little bit, you know, gibberish sometimes. That's because it's done with optical character recognition. So you do have to be a little patient with this, but I really am a big fan of World Vital Records. Okay. Now we're going to go to library subscription-only databases. Uh, ProQuest, historical newspapers, one of the best, but again, it's not available for personal subscription. And that's the big ones. And that's the big yeah. ones. Big yeah. newspapers, major newspapers. New York and, Times, uh, yeah, Washington Post, yeah, Chicago, Chicago Tribune, Tribune, Los Angeles Times. Right. That's that's their homepage here for searching, and it it even boasts the world's most comprehensive collection yeah. of news content. Now, we have a subscription at Western, but right. you can't, if your library doesn't have it, you can become a friend of Western's library and That's use, right. or any place that has it, and use it, use it from that. You can become a friend and get access to the databases. Correct. Okay. Uh, also, newsbank.com. This is library subscription only. Um, and uh, what they're good for is a, a file called America's Death Notices and Obituaries. Again, some of the information not available anyplace else. Uh, it's, a, it's a good resource to check. Here's the home page for NewsBank, and uh, it's a, it's a good, a good all-around database for death. Uh, yeah, so, and you, but you do have to have a library. You know, the library right. subscribes to it, not you. So you, you can, like, yeah. become a friend of whatever library has it. Yeah, and you can uh, get to it many access points, states, cities, regions, uh, and they have a map-based interface, so it offers a little more, but like I said, the drawback is library subscription. Uh, Obit's archive, uh, this comes from uh, uh, America's Death Notices and Obituaries. It offers a different way of getting access uh, without subscribing, without getting to the mm -hmm. uh, library subscription. You can look at obitsarchive.com 
and pay per view. So if you find something there, you can either pay to see the results because it only gives you the index information or not. But you can parlay that information into a big time newspaper uh, using uh, other uh, services that you don't have to pay for. What we like about this obitsarchive.com is the third uh, indicator over there of searching, obituary text. This is wonderful and done nowhere else. If you have uh, some information about the party that you're searching for, uh, like where did they go to school or college, what church they belong to, if they went to the Naval Academy, uh, you can search for survivors' names to see if they're in the body of mm -hmm. that death announcement. That's really useful if you have a, a deceased person whose name is fairly common, like right. John yeah. Taylor. But if John Taylor was married to someone named Loretta, wow, you can put that in that obituary text box, and then it will only pull up obituaries for John Taylor's where a Loretta was mentioned. So that, that's actually a really, Rosemary's yeah. right, that's actually a really good yeah. feature. And a little below uh, on the slide, you can see that you can narrow it uh, by, geogra yeah. by geography. So that's an mm -hmm. extremely good resource there. OK. Um, Here's our Penavaria clan again. Uh, we used uh, this uh, obit, archive.com, and because uh, you see the same examples at the top, the name examples, the date examples, and searching through the obituary text. So to uh, Thomas, uh, he's uh, listed there. That's the tax avoider. He that's died. That's the tax yeah. avoider in Pennsylvania, not the good people in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> but I am also happy to see that there is a saint among all these felons in the Panaveria family. Uh, <laughs> but the cool thing about this, you can actually, you don't have to pay Obit's archive to look at these because what I would do first is I would go to the Blairsville Dispatch or the Southtown Star website itself and see if they have put their obituaries in a kind of publicly available free archive. Lots and lots of newspapers do that. And you can get access to, like, the Chicago Tribune or big papers like that, like I said, through ProQuest. So, you know, I don't, I don't know. Obit's archive is making a mint off of these because I think, you know, obituaries are relevant to all genealogy research. But I would hesitate before paying even a couple of dollars each time. You know, I'd go and look for those, That's see if great. I can find them for free. But honestly, obituaries are not that easy to find. There's no single source for them. You really have to be patient with, with searching for them. Okay. Now let's talk about some free newspaper stuff. sources that are free. And these are, these are a bit of a mixed bag, but I love the ones that I'm going to talk about. I absolutely love Fulton History. It's a, it's a weird name. It doesn't say anything like, you know, newspapers here. Um, this guy who does this, um, he's kind of a, a bit of a, an eccentric. He started, I hope he's not listening. He started, <laughs> uh, he started off trying to document the history of his hometown, Fulton, New York, by scanning a bunch of postcards and old newspapers, and he eventually moved on to scanning newspapers for basically all, all the time. And his search interface is not that easy to use. This is what the results list looks like, and then he'll, he'll, he'll make, you can, you can download the original documents. That's what's so good about it, though. You can download the original image of the newspaper page itself. So really, once again, in that quest for original records and original sources without proof it isn't truth. Now this is going to help you. So, you know, in, in all places, even big cities, small towns, things were announced regularly. People When people died, when they got married, uh, and if they were in some kind of accident. But also, as Rosemary was saying before, even the tiny little fine print in the classifieds is going to be indexed. Real estate transfers, there had to be a published notice of that. Legal notices of probate, when an estate goes into probate, mm -hmm. things like that. So uh, Fulton history is really especially good for newspapers in the, on the East Coast, though he does have, um, to starting basically with New York and kind of moving on outwards, he does have a lot of the East Coast cities represented and even some California ones. So you know, it doesn't cost anything, so give him a try. 
Do, were you going to add something? Just it doesn't cost anything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. What have you got to lose, right? right? One of my other ones I really, really like, and this is on the other side of the country, is the California free. Digital Newspaper Collection, also free, and it's done by the University of California, Riverside. This is a really nice interface, and the images are just gorgeous. I mean, there's these old California newspapers that you never in a million years would have access to. I found this repository uh, when I was helping a, a different friend of mine research a murder that had occurred in her family in Southern California in the, in the 40s. And boy, I tell you, there, was, there were so many stories about this murder. But you know, it, it's, not, it, it's not something that you know, you're going to find. If you like you could do a Google search, you're not going to find this. You have, just have to know it's there and you have to go in and search it and you can download the images of the uh, newspapers. Okay. My turn, your turn. Okay, now we get back to government, the good stuff. <laughs> Chronicling America, historical newspapers from your friends at the Library of Congress. They're the website address, chroniclingamerica.loc.gov. Remember, when you're at a government site, always make it loc.gov if you're going to the Library of Congress. Any place else, .gov. If you put in .com, you're liable to get us. Rude shock. <laughs> okay, <laughs> here's the... Uh, page after a little search that we did, uh, we searched by area to get the newspapers from Kentucky. And as you can see, 78 newspapers, a lot of them small newspapers, are included here. Mm -hmm. Adair County News, uh, look at that date, nearly 100 years of it from Columbia, Kentucky, 1,185 issues. American Baptist from Louisville, 37 issues. If your dates happen to fall within that range, it's an excellent place to search because this is news, uh, local news. If um, your relatives uh, had a potluck and they mm -hmm. brought in the dessert, you'll know about it. Yeah, these tiny little places, they reported everything. You know, if yes. somebody was in a, not just if they were in a car accident or something, but yeah, the church news, you, you know, who was holding a party for, you know, a retirement party. I mean, and this, this is a great, great thing because basically this is your tax dollars at work. Right. Okay. <laughs> so money was actually appropriated and committed to uh, scan and preserve these fragile, de they, I guess they were crumbling newspapers, you know, that only existed in a few places. So really these were saved just in the nick of time. You know, they, they, they've got a range there, it says 1836 to 1922. You know, these things, newspaper isn't even a, a very strong substance. So these things were on their way to being lost completely. Right. And so, yeah, actually the Library of Congress, you know, is, is responsible for this. And the images are very nice and they're, they're, I wouldn't, I don't know that the searching is as easy as the browsing, but if you are, are doing research in one of these small towns, definitely give uh, Chronicling America a try. Okay. Moving on. Um, as a kind of free online news source, you really can't beat Google News Archive, but this is for recent news. This is not for the past. They don't, this is only goes back a, a couple of years. But if you're trying to keep up with like different parts of your family and different parts of the country, this really works good. And this free. A, yeah, and free. This is an example when I put my ah, surname. another Penavaria. <laughs> You what see, did Adam do? You, see, you have to go to the news tab. It's not. This is not the web tab. This is the news tab. And yeah, that uh, that guy, Adam Penavari, that is my 22-year-old son, who's a photographer, and he was working this summer for the Newport News Daily Press, and he was covering a story about the 13-year-old arrest. <laughs> uh -huh. But uh, you know, it's kind of weird, you know, that his name appears right under the word arrested. arrested. But, you know, that's. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's just walking in the footsteps of the ancestors here. Nah. No, no, he's a good kid. Yeah. Very talented. Back to the courts and mm -hmm. legal documents, my very fave. Um, <clears throat> Freedom of Information Act, we talked about this at the beginning. FOIA called FOIA, by those in the know, uh, .gov, always do .gov, and this is a way for for private citizens to get at information about themselves held by various government agencies. This is information that you have a right to know. It uh, should not be privileged, at least to you. You can also look for uh, data and information from relatives or from public figures or non-public figures. Uh, this exists 
uh, to let you have information that the government has collected over the years. Now, uh, how this works, every agency has either one person or an entire office <coughs> to uh, handle FOA, FOIA requests. And the way they do it is you have to describe what you want. You can't just send a blanket letter and say, everything you have about uh, yeah. William Taylor. Mm -hmm. No. You have to say exactly who you're talking about, exactly the circumstances. Uh, William Taylor, who is listed in the Nixon enemies list of the 1970s, you have to be very specific. Also, you have to target the probable agency that has it. FBI, Department of Justice, uh, you can't just do blanket stuff. But uh, if you hit the right office and get the information, as long as it's not sensitive to national security, you will get the entire document. Of course, they'll charge you for uh, photocopying the article. However, uh, if it is sensitive, then they will redact or edit the copy, uh, blacking out important sensitive information in their opinion. But you can keep going back and back and back to find info. Trial transcripts, another important, often overlooked document. Okay, this must be another pen of No, it wasn't. Oh, never mind. That was that murder I, I investigated for, uh, in California. Okay, um, this is the uh, trial transcript as it looks. It gives you the court. It gives you parallel citations, uh, 31 Cal 2nd 92, volume and page number, uh, and it gives it in very uh, um, different reporters. In case you had only one set of books, you could still find this uh, case. The uh, date is 1947. It tells you what happened after this. Somebody uh, applied to uh, get a rehearing and des denied 20 days later. Uh, and the prior history, what happened before it got to the Supreme Court of California. So uh, this is available in LexisNexis and Westlaw. If you are not familiar with those databases, uh, best search out uh, your local law librarian or reference librarian who has experience searching. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll be happy to do this for you. Yeah, Rosemary found this one for me. I, I was clueless as to you know how to find the actual trial transcript for this murder that I was investigating. So, um, and by the way, I, I was mentioning to Charlie earlier. Rosemary and I are actually in the process of preparing another presentation, basically all about court records, the different types of court records, and how to access access them, and about Westlaw and LexisNexis, and about how to use use the options that they have. So in case the court records uh, topic interests you, you just kind of look for that one in the future. OK, one of the types of court records that has a great deal of relevance in my family, at least, is divorce cases. And you have to remember that a divorce case before no-fault divorce, a divorce was actually a lawsuit where somebody sued another person. So there was a plaintiff and there was a defendant. So this is what a divorce uh, case file part in the very beginning of it looks like. You actually have, and this is this is um, my father's uh, great uncle and aunt. Uh, you have a, a plaintiff, um, Anthony Lacera. He was suing his wife, Antonetta Lacera, for, uh, as it turns out, for desertion. And it was kind of an unusual thing because you know this is the man suing the woman for desertion, and it's it's a. Um, it says complaint in chancery for divorce. That just basically means the civil court. This is not a criminal court record. This is a civil court record. And these kind of court records are not online. They may have, a, Ancestry has some, actually some states like California and Florida actually have their divorce indexes. Uh, you can look, but that's basically just seeing that they occurred. Mm -hmm. Okay, to actually see the case file, Oh, you're going to have to actually go to the courthouse. You, it's even hard to get them to do it for you at a distance. There's even really very little remote access. It's it's kind of maddening. Yeah. We're gonna. Um, I wanted to also reiterate: these are not on Lexis or Westlaw or searchable. No. Um, so this is strictly a no. local record. If you know there was a divorce, you or somebody else has to go to the court archive, courthouse. most likely, search in the index there in person and then order the case file, and then it takes like a week, then you have to go back, 
and then you can scan it. So it's not easy, but oh, is it, is it really worth it? <laughs> Divorce case files are the most entertaining thing you will ever read. See, look at this. The plaintiff and defendant continuously quarreled over the fact that the defendant absented herself from her home and household duties during the day and returned at 11 or 12 o'clock at night. What the heck was Antonetta doing during the day? She had four or five kids at this time. <laughs> and Antonio, I mean, she, he had to be working. What were the kids doing? Looking after themselves. I mean, the cool thing about these, these divorce things, of course, you know, I say cool thing, but they really, really capture the, you know, the kind of at the time, you know, what was really happening with this family. They'll have witness statements where, you know, the mother or the neighbors will say, oh, yeah, I heard him arguing all the time. And one time he threw an ashtray at her. I mean, it's. <laughs> I, I really hate to say it, but you know this is like this is like watching you know an ambulance. What do you call it? like when you go by a, a car accident? Yeah. yeah, this is like, ooh, look at that. Look, look how yeah, rubbernecky. Look how miserable they were. <laughs> As the world turns. Yeah. Okay, another court document, probate case files. Important. You can only find them at the scene. Yeah. Uh, Mary and uh, John Christoy. These are uh, people that are related to Cap. My grandparents, yeah. Grandparents. Um, this is a probate file. So she didn't make a will. She didn't. Right. So um, apparently there were contentious oh, heirs. Yeah. So they had to go <laughs> through probate. Um, and this uh, is a record. Again, you have to be there to check it out in the indexes at the courthouse. Yeah, now probate file, I mean, that's going to be really valuable because a probate has to, it's like a judge has to decide who are the legal heirs of this yeah. person who stupidly did not make a will <laughs> to say who their heirs were, okay? So if Mary, my grandmother could have made a will that said my granddaughter Catherine is my only heir and gets everything I have, but she didn't. And so they had to do this probate. And it, 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 they had to determine, you know, who were her legal heirs, i.e., you know, uh, any uh, siblings or children. And then they all, ha and they have to divide it evenly. There has to be a trustee. So, you know, uh, the, one of the mottos that I tend to, to remember is that where, where trouble goes, paperwork Remarkable. follows, okay? When your family members that you're researching have had any kind of trouble, there's going to be newspaper stories and there's going to be court records. So probate is trouble. It meant it meant a big hassle for my mom and her sister. And, you know, it was my grandma just, I don't know. She just, I don't know, think she liked paperwork. <laughs> One of my um, favorite types of court records that I discovered over the past several years is inquest records. This is an inquest is a jury trial to determine how a person died. It's not to determine who was responsible for the death but m rather the manner of death. If a person was found deceased and no one could explain why, they, they, most municipalities have held inquests where a jury has to hear evidence and call witnesses and the judge has to moderate it. And then they say, we have determined that this person met their death either through uh, an accident or through homicide or through suicide or through a manner unknown. Those are basically our four options. And I have an inquest record in my family that <clears throat> I found. Don't ask me how I found it because <laughs> this is actually for my great-grandfather's brother, Filippo Penavaria, a native of Sicily. And you can see through kind of poor copying and transcribing the name, uh, the name has become Irish. It's become Penmara, which I can assure you it is definitely not Irish. Um, but I found it, and it, I knew he had been, I knew he had died at this time, and I was, I don't know, I was able to somehow determine that, that he was murdered. And this, actually, the jury determined that he met his death from shock and hemorrhage and peritonitis from stab wounds of the abdomen and back inflicted by knife without an E, held in hand of one Vincenzo Chicano at home of deceased at 6 o'clock p.m. January 24, 1910. So this is the jury's statement, their judgment, and then there's a witness list, and that's how they knew the name of the assailant, because there were witnesses, and they recommended that this, this man be picked up, but he, he never was apprehended, and this then became a homicide investigation in the Chicago Police Department, 
which was never solved. So anyway, that's, that's one of the um, inquest files from my family records. This one isn't from my family, but I just wanted to say, if you see as a cause of death something like gunshot wound, <laughs> there's going to be an inquest, believe me. Nobody's going to be like, oh, I guess it was just a gunshot wound. Yeah. Let's go next. Um, you can kind of see that somebody, the, the original uh, doctor who filled this out, ha has written gunshot wound of spinal cord, and then another person with a totally different handwriting and a lighter pen has written the word homicidal. Actually, I think they spelled that wrong right. with an S. <laughs> But that's most likely the result of an inquest. In other words, they've gone back and, and modified the death record to reflect the inquest findings. So you want to be thorough and do that reasonably exhaustive genealogy search that the, the professionals talk about, then you would go and look for this inquest record. But you're not going to find it easily. It's not going to, you're not going to be getting it online. You have to go either contact the court. I got that one about Filippo Penavaria um, just by calling them and, and uh, asking them to do a search. I think I had to pay a search fee. And anyway, we, we found it. But inquest files are always, always valuable. Sometimes you see on a death certificate, inquest pending. That means that this, this inquest jury trial is in the process. And nobody has updated this death certificate yet. But there's going to be an inquest file for you to find. OK. We thought we would mention some local resources for our uh, neighbor states. The best places to go from a statewide point of view is Genealogical Society of the State and the State Library, so KDLA. Uh, in you know, Ohio, uh, www.ogs.org, the State Library, library.ohio.gov. There is a great similarity amongst the web addresses. Here's Indiana's um, and Indiana State Library also listed. Tennessee, uh, uh, again, our neighbors that uh, uh, very good places for resources that are not necessarily in any other big. No, place. no, because these are local. These are local. Yeah, right. And uh, KDLA, KDLA.ky. I mean, if you're doing research in a place, you know, there's going to be people, other people doing research. So, you know, like the Kentucky Genealogical Society is likely to have people in it who have maybe researched Muhlenberg County or something like that. You know, you just want to kind of tap into work other people have already done. Yeah. And sometimes local experts can actually open the whole thing up, you know, where, you, you know, Ancestry tends to have quite, it's very good with federal level records, but these local records and the state libraries, including KDLA, yay, That's right, yay. <laughs> our sponsor. So. I, th this is something that, you know, you never know till you get there, basically, uh, what you're going to find in these local mm -hmm. resources. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I just want to go over some other resources. First, if you don't know about the Family History Library in Salt Lake City, I'm, then it is my pleasure to introduce you to it. It is an actual place. It is the only genealogy library dedicated to the subject. There's other libraries that have genealogy collections, but uh, honestly, they're, they're all small fish compared to the Family History Library. This is a, a library run by the Mormon Church. And the Mormons, as a result of their own um, interests, have for decades been going around the world photographing and microfilming records uh, birth, death, and marriage records mostly, but also property records and things like that from all over the world, okay? And, and so they have a vault of all these microfilms with millions and millions of these records, which you will not find anywhere else. And this is the place to go for international records. I said I didn't really think much of Ancestry's international component. If you have an international uh, level to your family research like I do, you know, like all my immigrant ancestors around 1900, then the Family History Library is going to be the one thing you can't do without. So if you're ready to cross the pond, basically, then the FHL is it. Now, they do have a website. And at their website, which is called Family Search, all right, at their website, they have made available many, many digitized images from these microfilms. Now, they, haven't be, they aren't even halfway through digitizing their microfilms. 
And even a lot of the digitized images themselves are not indexed yet. So I wouldn't rely too much on searching the index yet. You, you really, you know, you want to go and look at the original records like, um, you know, Rosemary and I were just doing this the other day for her family, just looking at all the birth records for this tiny little county in Texas just to see if we could locate one specific one. You just flip through them like flipping through a microphone. Notice I've circled the words free account. I really want to stress this. Family Search is an equal powerhouse to Ancestry, and yet they are giving away what you pay, you know, hundreds of dollars every year for from Ancestry, and they don't overlap that much. Family Search also offers the census, but for the most part, what they have are indexes created from their microfilms, which Ancestry doesn't have. So think of these as the big two that you absolutely need to do. These are, and these, these are the goods here. These are the original records available for free download. You just can't do without Family Search. I think I've made that point clear. Okay. Yes. <laughs> now here's one of my favorite places, the cemetery records. Uh, the sexton or cemetery caretaker, sexton may be an old title for the position. Um, they are the keeper of the records for their cemetery. These are not online, never online. They're, um, and they're private. And too. they are private because cemeteries are usually either privately owned by the funeral homes or, the or by the church. Uh, they are not uh, even required to give you this information. No. So. Uh, you have to be very nice and conciliatory and bring candy <laughs> when you go to talk to the sexton. They usually have giant books where in uh -huh. handwriting you can find out uh, relationship clues, you can find out affiliated clergy names, interment history, the plot owner, the cost of the burial and or plot. And when, now, I, when Rosemary I, put interment history, I was like, what do you mean interment history? They were buried. What's, what's, you know, what history is there? My family has a tendency to move. <laughs> um, even after death. So uh, when one moves from St. Patrick number one to St. Patrick number two cemetery. Uh, okay. Nice. Well, I'll tell you, I may have felons in my family history, but we stayed put but, once we yeah, were married. Honestly, true. we went in the ground, and that's where we stayed. Okay. All right. This is a sample of a record of funeral that a sexton keeps. Notice they have categories, but they're, you know, everything is filled in. In pencil, there you see the cost of things in 1941, um, a lot of information on place of death, cause of death, and again, this is a jumping off point. If you see that uh, stabbing or murder or drowning, uh -huh. something that is unusual, then you hit the newspapers to find out right. uh, more about that. But uh, these are wonderful records, and you have to be there to get them. So in other words, the easiest way to find records is to know that they're there to be found. So right. when you see those indications that there might be others, that's when you go for them. Another Panavaria. No, 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 no. Oh. That's Al Capone. Oh, never mind. Maybe a... He looks like people in my family, but... <laughs> maybe, a, maybe a cousin. Okay. No. <laughs> um, find a grave, a free place to go. Uh, www.findagrave.com, and uh, this this is maintained by people. Uh, so yeah, it's user not, generated. It, yeah, uh, people generated, but it does give you on at least famous penavarias lots of information <laughs> on dates and uh, where their birth and death. I even found out Alphonse middle name Gabriel. Yeah. Interesting, uh, and it's for every state. And sometimes when you get to a city like New Orleans, which is a very big city, uh, and multiple uh, graves and grave sites, uh, it'll even tell you which grave site, uh, right. which cemetery they're buried. And so. the cool thing about this, find a grave is awesome. It was acquired by Ancestry, I think, about three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't need to use Ancestry to get to it. You can right. still use the Find a Grave website for free. If you set up an account, you can create burial records, but you don't even need to do that to access them. Right. And it's also, if you search in Google, if you search a person's name, if there's a Find a Grave record, it will come up. So actually, Google indexes Find a Grave, which I think is really awesome. Yeah. OK, we have a gem here in Bowling Green called the Kentucky Library. And they are wonderful. We have some of them on our uh, list here today uh, at this webinar, but they are very helpful people, and I know there's a Kentucky Library equivalent 
in your area with lots of local records and knowledgeable people who are eager to share what they have learned and their wonderful libraries. Um, one more. One more. Okay. Uh, here's an, another uh, website. It is pay for, but it is unique in that it deals with military records. Mm -hmm. um, it's called fold3.com, and that comes from the number of times you fold an American flag. Uh, it's got records from the wars, Revolutionary, Mexican American, Civil War. Uh, and yeah. Ancestry has military records as well. Thank and you. a lot of military Hi. records are not online. So that's a whole thing we have never even gotten into. You actually have to order them from the Personnel Records Center. Correct. And you can get a free trial, seven days, but then they're going to ask you to pay for it. Oh, yeah. So um, a possibility to use it. One of my favorite things to do is to go to the about.com genealogy pages and see what Kimberly Powell has to say about different subjects. I think she is really terrific. She's a, a really good writer, and that's important to me. So if I had a friend who was like, I have Swedish ancestry, you know, what do you recommend? And I was like, oh, let's see what Kimberly Powell recommends. And what she'll do is she'll just kind of put together, well, if you have Swedish ancestry, you might want to use this, and there's some specialized things. It's just a really quick... You can do a quick search and check, and she's got some, some really interesting articles about some very, very specific types of searching. So I highly recommend this as just a, kind of a, a thing to check out if you want a big picture of, of certain. And she keeps it up to date, so it's really good. One, I, I find this website essential, and everybody I talk to says I'd never even heard of that. This guy, Steve Morse, has this website, stevemorse.org. He was a computer uh, programmer and a, he designed, he was one of the designers of this one type of microchip that is in everything. Anyway, so he turned his considerable data crunching ability to creating tools for searching the census and searching immigration records and he calls them his one step web pages and that's the that's his full name, and that's the web address. And this is what uh, it, I don't. His web interface is not that pretty, but um, so for example, when I when I say he created tools, he doesn't have original records at his site. You don't when you if you clicked on this link here to the census, you're not going to get census records. What you're going to get are searching tools. So if you couldn't find somebody. He has different things where that you, will help you identify the enumeration district, and that's the census is basically that's the grouping, that's the political uh, grouping that they do that for other things as well. So that an uh, area is divided into wards, which are divided into enumeration district, and so each enumeration district is basically like where I'm from in Chicago, be like about a four or five block area, square block area. And really what that's going to give you then, if you can get to the batch of pages for that enumeration district, which you know the, the family you're researching lived in, you can just look through all 30 pages to see where and who, who lived next door to them and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. One other resource we haven't talked about, a pay-for service, uh, Heritage Quest Online. Libraries. Um, libraries, yeah, library service new and improved interface, and more searching power. So we don't want to neglect them because yeah, I didn't used they're to like still it. in. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's gotten better. It was always the stepchild of the yeah. ancestry. <laughs> but, you know, you get that through libraries, yeah. It's coming. Um, another government website, yay, archives.gov, be sure, .gov, because you put .com, you may get a nasty surprise. Um, but this, they are the basis from which ancestry takes its Right. Uh, census records and other things. It has a huge microfilm uh, archive there. Uh, so it is wonderful. They're putting some stuff online, but you still need to look at other sources. Um, it's, it's not all inclusive. Now, the thing about National Archives is that I really, really want to um, point out is that I, I actually tell this whole story in my book. The na you, you know, the National Archives haven't even been around 100 years, hasn't even been around 100 years. It hasn't even been 100 years since our government decided that it might be a good idea to create a specific dedicated building that could house, securely house the documents that are vital to the history of our nation. And sadly, the National Archives, which um, was a actually was dedicated in the 1930s, got the idea for it 
started in the 1920s after, and a lot of you know this, I'm sure, after the 1890 census was virtually destroyed, and only about 6,000 names are still readable on the pages that were burned. Uh, it was destroyed because they kept it on open shelves in boxes in a basement somewhere. And, you know, it's just heartbreaking uh, to, to think of that loss. And anybody who's researching their American history, you know, and it, it hit that 1890, and it's just like, ah, if only that hadn't happened. Um, I always think that if I had a time machine, Rosemary, I would go back and save mm -hmm. the 1890 census. I, yes, I would. I would not do anything else. Um, so they started the National Archives, and now it's just this fortress-like building in Washington. It's really terrific, and they've got the Constitution and the and the Declaration of Independence. But those things were all kept in separate places, and I've got I've got some pictures in my files of like national records housed in parking lots, and, I mean parking garages and stuff with tires leaning up against them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, Charlie, to answer your question, I didn't know that Ancestry had acquired Fold3, so sorry, haven't been keeping up with them, so I couldn't even begin to tell you how much their content overlaps. I'd have to look into that, and so thank you for letting me know for future things. One final thing I want to recommend to you as a kind of non-Ancestry thing is to use Google Maps. Now, if you've only used Google Maps as a way of getting someplace, like to get directions, you're missing out on one of the cool things genealogy-related that they do. You can actually see pictures of properties. So if you are thinking to see what does the house that my parents or grandparents grew up in look like now, you just put this, this is the house that my mother grew up on in Oconto Avenue in Chicago. I haven't seen it in decades, but, you know, there it is, that tiny little house next to the one with the green roof that's shaded by the tree. But, I mean, this is, this is really cool because you, can, you can't tell from a static slide, but, you know, you can actually, using this as the street view uh, in Google Maps, you can actually kind of turn around and look around the whole neighborhood, and you can kind of, quote, unquote, walk down the street by just using the cursor. So I use this all the time just to sort of see the neighborhoods, what they look like now, where the people I'm researching lived. And, you know, I can then, when I'm writing my history, I can say, yes, and there's a dentist office now where the house once stood. So things like that. All right. I think we're done. Ta-da, we're done. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Okay. Back to you, Charlie. Thank you very much, ladies. I'm going to um, switch the screen over, put up a final slide here, and give everybody the opportunity to download the, the presentation. So the files download box that it mentions there um, on that final PowerPoint slide is down at the bottom right hand corner of the screen if you want to download the presentation. There's a bit of an echo, but I think we'll lose. <laughs> See, and if, if, if everybody's hearing an echo, we're almost done. Um, we do have the contact information for Catherine and Rosemary. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, we'll be, we'll be happy to try to take a stab at it. I like your yes. point, Nancy, about Zillow. I have actually used that as well for that purpose. It's the same thing. It's really just to get a look at the houses. And where I'm from in Cook County, Illinois, the actually the property tax records are online. You, you know, they're not. You're not going to find them through a Google search, but you have to go to the property tax assessor's office and and use their special database. But they have all these old papers scanned and um, uh, pictures of the properties that, that, yeah. that, you know, reflecting remodeling and things like that. So maybe whatever municipality you're dealing with also has that. Good point, Erin. Uh, PVAs, Property Valuation Administrators, are mm -hmm, great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, also very good point. And that's one of those kind of the kind of records that the county or the, the city keeps that you're, like you said, you're not going to get to it so easily, but... Yeah, thank you, uh, Jan, oh, for thanks. reminding us about uh, the digitized newspapers uh, at oh, Kentucky God. Digital Library. I'm sorry yes. we forgot to mention that. That's actually, that would have been a good slide to have. So thank yeah. you, everybody. Please notice that the uh, historical newspapers for Kentucky. We were trying to throw in, you know, national level and state level stuff. I know a lot of you deal with people who are doing local area stuff. Thank you. I appreciate that about the book. That's terrific. Yeah, yeah. Great.
Well, I, I, this has been a lot of fun. We, Rosemary and I love doing these presentations. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll, we'll be coming back on your screens with our court records, uh, which, as Charlie suggested, we're going to do a, a, a run through before we uh, go. Maybe, hopefully, go to ALA with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be excellent. We'll be glad to be your guinea pigs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because Rosemary is really good at searching like pro, uh, Westlaw and uh, LexisNexis. I mean, she has taught me so much about searching for court records. I started off just having no idea. And, you know, it, to me, legal records have always been kind of scary. So I've always been kind of like, oh, I don't really want to dive into that. But mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have to thank Catherine because she is finding my squirrely relatives wherever they have scurried. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> or wherever they're buried for the fifth time. Well, yeah. <laughs> and and Rosemary's just joking around. She doesn't really disrespect my family. It's just kind of a no, joke. No. It's a joke between us because I always use these examples of my yeah. my relatives in our presentations, and she just <laughs> she just likes to bring in Godfather references. And oh, and when you got a name like Penavaria, that's fair. Right. I understand. Yeah. And you're from Chicago, and your family was in the mafia. I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> It's a very exciting family you, live, you have there. Uh, if we have any final questions as, a, as we come around to uh, the end of our presentation, please go ahead and chat them in. We'll stick around for a couple more minutes. Otherwise, whenever you're ready to exit, you can just click that X in the top right-hand corner of the screen. And as Rosemary mentioned at the, at the beginning of class, this class was recorded. So uh, it will be posted on our archive webinar page within about a week. Uh, you can go back and refer to it or share it with any of your colleagues. Uh, your and Betty, you can absolutely count on us to come and talk about yeah. census records and brick walls. We'd love to do it. You know, we're coming up to Litchfield next month to talk next about month. the DNA stuff that we did last time. So yeah, we'll we'll be we'll talk about that later when we're when we're up there with you. Yeah. Now we we already hey. have. We've we already travel. done. Yeah, we we have a traveling sideshow. <laughs> me and P. T. Barnum here. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Our time is free. We just ask for mileage. Yeah, this is what we do for our uh, our job. So yeah, oh, yeah. we really uh, you know we this is a fun this is the fun part of our job. Yeah, yeah. It releases our inner ham. So. <laughs> <laughs> Rosemary has been known to do Godfather imitations in our presentations. Uh, yeah. Oh boy, that was yeah. Oh, she does a good one. Yeah, it is. <laughs> All right, well, Thank I guess we, we said everything. So, oh, wait, hold on. And oh, here are the trails. Oh, okay. I don't oh. even know about that one. No, wow. thank you, Jenna. That's good. Okay. That's a good one. I've never even heard of that. See, I'm Let's always write that learning. Down. I am always learning, and I'm always happy oh. to, you know, hear about new things and things of mergers and stuff. Yeah. If I could sing, I would sing from uh, The King and I, By Your Pupils You'll Be Taught. Okay. <laughs> So ancestral trail. Don't encourage her to sing, no, really. Don't, don't. <laughs> Regret it. Maybe not now, for the rest of your life. Well, um, you know, Rosemary and I are happy to answer any questions anybody has. You know, you just email us. You know where we work. We work at Western Kentucky University. You can yeah. find us quite easily. We have our own little profile. And you know profile. what we look like. Yeah. <laughs> you, we got our own profile pages there. So, you know, if anybody has anything to say or whatever, you want us to come and speak, we're, we're available. Yeah, we'll come to your house if you want. <laughs> have dinner. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. <laughs> wow, thank you. That's really good information. They have small books available for purchase. Oh, cool. Wow. Who has small books available? AHS, ATHS. A Ancestral Trails. That is definitely a new one on me. I'm going to have to check yeah. that out. Did you write that down? I did. Well, I guess that looks yeah, I think, like yeah, I think the chat's slowing down a little bit, so we'll uh, officially Appreciate the comments. The Thank you so much. Yes. Thanks, everyone, for the feedback. Thank you for attending today. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs>